All right. Welcome, everybody. Hawk v. Wolf. Yep. Totes. We're back. And super special guest. Hell yeah. Andrew Huberman is here. We have been trying to, to get you on the podcast. We appreciate you making time. Yeah. Oh, I'm thrilled to be here. It's uh, been a long time coming, and I've been watching and following you guys for a long, long time before following was a thing. You know, oh, thank so. you. My uh, actually, I I um, learned about your podcast and everything through my wife, and then at some point she's like, "I think he skated." Yeah, he, he did. did. <laughs> <laughs> he did. Welcome. Here we go. And I'm not Tony Hawk. Picked it up at like 12 or 13, like every kid when it was you guys, Bones Brigade. Um, posters on every kid's wall. And then some of the kids moved into water polo and soccer. And then me and another guy named Paul Zwanich, who rode for Earth. Actually, Chris Miller picked, picked oh. him up from a sponsor me tape. Mm -hmm. Put him on Earth. He was in the Now and Later video. So my best friend. And then... Where, where was that? Uh, he, we lived up in uh, Bay Area. Okay. Pa Palo Alto Mountain View area. So mm -hmm. South Bay. So there was the San Jose scene. There was the EMB scene. And we'd go back and forth. But we were on the peninsula, as they called it. And Paul was really good. Uh, he rode for Earth, then he rode for Dogtown, then for Think Thunder. Worked oh, wow. at high speed, and then um, and I skated. I wasn't very good. I mean, I could hang in there, but I wasn't. You know, I wasn't fated to uh, make a career of it. But I loved it. Loved the community. Started going to Embarcadero and <clears throat> made friends with Carl Watson, Nick Lockman, and all those heads. And then the great Jim Thebo. And so I was oh, part yeah. of that scene, but I wasn't really central to any of those scenes. But uh, I mean. I was a skateboarder. You know, That's so you know, that, and yeah. those are the those are the dark years, especially of yeah. street skating. Yeah, little wheels yeah. and baggy yeah. clothes, and um, and uh, rode some castle contests. So we could talk about that. Um, some NSA, I guess it was NSA castle. I can't remember, but the um, but that was my life. It was it was my life from thirteen until about sixteen, and then I kept getting hurt, and I got into Muay Thai and some other things, and then academia. But I always kept a, a piece in it. And then when I was a postdoc at Stanford, so this is after you finish your. PhD to a five-year postdoc, it's like a residency in medicine, but not medicine. Um, we had I had access to Burgess Park in Menlo Park, so I started skating transition and then going to San Jose Skate Park because my after you at Stanford, while yeah while, while I was you're a at postdoc, Stanford. so I was riding in my thirties. I can still have a little frontside grind on pool coping if I pump oh, hard sick. enough. I mean, I'm not I'm not gonna um, impress anybody with my skills, but I can I'm comfortable on a skateboard. Yeah, it's like it doesn't. It used to feel more comfortable in walking, but yeah, that was my transportation. That's what I did. And, yeah. I mean, I consider myself a skateboarder. You know, I was going to say, I don't, don't you feel like you carry those ethos with you even when you're doing all this and have all the success oh, in other absolutely. areas? <laughs> I mean, I'm always watching what people are doing. And um, Mike Blayback mm -hmm. is the photographer and does all the Maestro. aesthetic stuff. Maestro photography is uh, amazing. One of my closest friends now and is part of the core four or six guys on our podcast team. And then... Martin Phobes and Chris Ray from DC. So we poached a lot of skateboarders from skateboard companies. Because <laughs> yeah. if you want to make content, you do it with skateboarders. That's the way to do it. I so. think it's weird that people are surprised that you are a skateboarder, as in maybe they think if you're a skateboarder, you can't be smart. <laughs> Thank you. Is that what you're going for? <laughs> yeah. Like, like, <laughs> like it's like, oh, wow, really? You're, you're such a smart guy and you're a skateboarder? Because I feel like people might get it twisted, but you'd be surprised. Uh, Huberman and I are very similar, very level, same levels of intelligence. I'm very smart. People don't know that. It's true. No, yeah. I, 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 I'd never know if you're making a joke or not, but you are smart. I think intelligence is one of those things where, you know, you learn the landscape and the facts and the skills you need to learn. I mean, I realized I wasn't going to be a professional skateboarder. Uh, Steve Ruge at Thunder and the guys at Real put, they started put me on flow flow team for a while. Out of, yeah. I think out of sympathy. Thank you, Shrugi. That's um, something. It was something. It felt great. It felt great. But he was the one who told me. He's like, listen, you're never going to be one of the big guys. If you want to do something in skateboarding, you ought to think about getting involved in the industry side. And I thought about that for a while. But then I tripped and fell into biology and kind of the rest of Tripped history. and fell. I know, like, yeah. Then I got into academia. Well, I, I followed a high school girlfriend down to Santa Barbara, and I wasn't intending to go to UC Santa Barbara. But then I wanted to be with her, and then I thought about joining the fire department, and then I realized getting a degree might be a good thing and some structure, and so But I, no interest in it before? I've always before. liked biology and animals okay, and understanding things. Okay, so there was things. something. Oh, I'm, I'm like 
I devour books. I mean, I okay. Just, and back know, then you did too. I did since I was a little kid. Okay. But books about everything. Books so about weapons, books about there. sex, books about skateboarding. I mean, there weren't books about skateboarding, but you but know. To, the idea of going there didn't seem, you were like, I'm just going to consume information because yeah. it's it's not difficult for you to do so. So you went there and it wasn't, it sounds like it was pretty easy transition, in, in, in especially considering you didn't really have an interest in it before. Yeah, I mean, without going into the whole backstory, I mean, I had a pretty healthy family growing up, and then my parents split up at about 13, right about the time I got into skateboarding and going to Embarcadero and going on little van tours. Not for vans, guys. Skateboarders are just relentless. Like, if you say, <laughs> it's so tour. crazy, it's true, though, though, right? No, I'm just, like, why is he protecting get, himself so much? Well, I'll tell you why. I'm not. <laughs> I'm like, it's unnecessary. Because, I know, dude. Because cool. skate, no, I mean, I think it's because uh, I don't want to give the impression that, you know, I was fated to, you know, so yeah, did, got lucky because. Um, our friend Jake Rosenberg went to my high school. He was filming Guy and Gons and Jason and all those guys yeah. at his house. So, you know, got to hang out with all those guys. But that's different than skateboarding like those guys. I knew that there was a gap there, right? That there was. It just doesn't yeah. count to me. I, I said to somebody before you came in today that the guys that were skateboarders that knew that they weren't going to be pro were more hardcore than us. Because I, I knew that there was a payoff. Mm. Like I was going to do it regardless. But it also helped to know that somebody was going to give me free gear, give me money. Wherever I went to the ramp, everyone's like, oh, so-and-so's here. Right. That felt good. When you guys but got it, early fame, I mean, you know, I don't um, I don't recall until maybe doing some podcasting, you know, walking in a room and people clapping is not something that uh, getting excited to see you is something that you guys experienced young. No, skateboarding in that community, in the punk rock community in the East Bay, was like my non-biological family. Because at that point, my biological family pretty much disintegrated. Right. It's, you know, my dad moved away and things were really, I was really feral. So it was great. I mean, I learned a lot. <laughs> I learned a lot sleep about- sleep on the, on the streets I didn't live in Embarcadero. I lived at a guy named Ray Meyer's house. Do you okay. remember Ray Meyer? Yeah. He lived with his parents. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, I spent some time out of school that eventually got me um, sort of on forced uh, control of the of the the system for a little while and then got let back into school. Then I got a girlfriend and started getting really into martial arts and really into weightlifting and really into running. And I was still skateboarding a bit, but then I kind of fell out of it. Was but, she into martial arts? And no, no. She was she was into horseback riding and, and being a high school girl. <laughs> she was into yeah. structure. She was into structure. She was she, the one that went got, to college. You into structure. Exactly. Okay. And then, so, exactly. So, there, I would say from 13 to 19, I was pretty wayward. Barely graduated high school. I showed up to my graduation. I don't know how. I don't know how I graduated, but I graduated. Um, and then I went to community college. I eventually got into UC Santa Barbara, but my first two quarters of UC Santa Barbara, I pretty much flunked out. I was getting in fights. I wasn't going to class. I was just, I was a complete screw up. But, you know, I was 17 years old and, yeah. you know, and it was a, there was a, the environment of, you know, tons of girls and drinking and partying and, I was 17 years old and I was coming to it for, as a skateboarder. So there were all these kids that had just lived at home and never gotten out of the house. They're like, no way, and going crazy. And for me, it was more like, well, you know, I'd hung out in Embarcadero, gone on some van tours. I didn't really have much parental oversight in the previous five or six years. Right. And so I really knew how to cash in on the environment. It was right. like, this is amazing. But school didn't happen. So what happened was I took myself out of Santa Barbara, moved home, started working, going to community college and got serious. So there was a kind of a a moment, a cliff when I was about 19 and I was like, listen, I'm, I, I realized I'm not going to be a skateboarder. I don't have any connections to the industry anymore. I was doing some Thai boxing, but there wasn't really anything to it at that point. Yeah. Um, I wasn't good at anything. I'm like getting in fights, I work at a bagel cafe. Like I'm good at making, ba you know, smearing cream cheese on bagels, which is a job, yeah. right? But that's when I realized, I'm like, what am I good at? I'm good at learning and reading and I enjoy it. So this is the but moment. It seemed like I'm you just going to, you know. Some I mean, will... Like you just saying that you worked at that store, like that's no nothing wrong with that, but that's not for you. You were destined to be like excel at something. Well, I've always had a, I would say, uh, my gears turn fast. Right. Like I, I wake up in the morning, and some days I'm kind of groggy and I'm kind of didn't sleep well or something. But most days, if I sleep well, yeah, I've, I've always had a kind of intensity for anything. I do. Right. So you know, skateboarding was like skateboarding, skateboarding, skateboarding. Right. I was gonna see what I could do with it. There you go. And and I think. Looking back, I had a ton of fun with it, and the friendships, and the fun, and you guys know. But I mean, and but also the hustle and the drive. Yeah, I mean that's what it takes to be a skateboarder on any level. You already learn that early on. Yeah, and falling, and and you know there weren't always filmers with us, and if there there were, they weren't pointing the camera at me. You know, so so I was I was really driven, and then 
Um, and then once I sunk my teeth into Thai boxing, I got really into that. And once I sunk my teeth into um, school, that was it. I was just like, and you know, it was interesting because I looked at school and I realized you don't actually, <laughs> it's so trivial and obvious when I look back, but I realized I'm like, you know, unlike skateboarding, I can read until I collapse and I don't get hurt, yeah. right? I can work like a maniac. I can just study, 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 study and learn. And so there was a direct relationship between how hard I worked and then my, my score. So I went from like a CD student to a straight A student. So there's this one class I got a B plus in that I'm still pissed off about. <laughs> and it was that way the whole way through. Um, it was just um, biology, psychology, <laughs> molecular biology, and I just loved it. I fell in love with it. And the community of science um, was different, obviously, than skateboarding. Yeah. Uh, you know, people um, behaved in uh, different ways, um, but it was also really welcoming. And I was really blessed. I had three advisors, undergraduate advisor, graduate PhD advisor, and my postdoc advisor, all of whom were amazing mentors and really encouraged me. They yeah. saw how much, you know, I literally lived in the laboratory as a PhD student. I was like, why pay rent and just stay here? spend the money going snowboarding. I was close to Tahoe. But like, you stayed in the... I slept in the lab. Yeah. At the time I was single, I'd bring dates to the lab. Yeah. yeah. Show them some brains, you yeah. know? Yeah. Oh, what, brains you always know? get some. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, that, that. <laughs> Sorry. Hey, fellas, do you sometimes need a little help in the bedroom? Erectile dysfunction is a common medical issue that over 30 million men in the U.S. tackle every day. We've all had those nights where we get too nervous and need just a little help. Yeah, I'm used to admitting stuff wrong with me, so yeah, I need that. The doctors at RexMD will evaluate you online, no office visit needed, and ship medication directly to your door before the big day. They're the most trusted leader in men's telehealth. Take advantage of their best deal ever and save up to 90% off. 90% off. That's, that's almost free, that's Tony. That's like almost free, right. Yeah. That's, that's borderline free. And pay as low as $2 per dosage with our exclusive link. Go to rexmd.com slash HVW for this limited time deal. Act now to take advantage of their deal by heading to rexmd.com slash HVW. Our exclusive deal will save up to 90% off where you'll pay as low as $2 per dose on generic Viagra instead of $90 on Viagra. Starter packs of generic Viagra Cialis are now available for our listeners to get started. That's rexmd.com slash HVW for up to 90% off and a free gift. Your partner will thank you. And then when I was a <laughs> professor, I got, you know, it was the first time I got a reasonable salary. It wasn't, you know, they don't pay academics a lot, but I got a house. I bought my first home. You know, yeah. I was 35 at that point, but a bulldog. Um, and I had a laboratory and I was commuting back and forth. I was at UC San Diego then, not um, Stanford. It was the same thing. And I was a skateboard mentality. I was like, Costello, I told my bulldog, I'm like, listen, we're moving into the lab. For all my fish tanks, I have my skateboard. I still <laughs> yeah. push around campus. Yeah. And I was like, why would I commute back and forth? And I had the house. I'd rent out the house a little bit, make some extra cash. And um, <laughs> and so I've always had that kind of, you know, sleep like a sardine. And and on the couch, I can sleep anywhere. I can work until I collapse and get right back to that, it. I've had to, teach, I've had to what, domesticate myself. That's I never, what the van I'm like you, Jason. I'm still trying to domesticate <laughs> myself. That, that's what the van trips teach you for sure. Oh, yeah. You can sleep yeah. anywhere. Yeah, and you can and you can hold your pee. Because on a van yeah. trip, you like, no, one stops, more, like no one's stopping. So you have to you have to. Or learn. you can discreetly use a bottle. Or you can discreetly use a bottle. Yeah. So I've got uh, questions because <laughs> there's a lot in that joke. I, I need to know. I need to know stuff, and we don't have you for that long. So I recently uh, I used to shave my I, used to, I started shaving my ankles because I used to sprain my ankles a lot, and I've used sports tape with with that with the under tape. It wouldn't work, so I would just use sports tape with no under tape. So every time I pull the tape off, it would rip my hair out. So I shaved my hair from my calf down to my foot. And then I had like fuzzy blonde hair on my knees and I didn't like it. So I shaved over my knees and then I just shaved up and then I realized like it doesn't add up. So I just started shaving everything. Can't you use Nair or whatever that stuff was? No, nah, I tried yeah. that a couple of times, but it I- It can't I've, be good for you. My wife has explained to me that it's not about shaving because she sees me shave. I shave under my arms and I don't have any hair under my arms. Like so you I, just like the way it feels? I just go over my body with a shaver. It's like some sort of thing that like, I feel like I'm clean. It's like a, maybe it's an OCD thing, I but say, yeah. it makes it's like a little bit of a meditation time for me to like. How often do you have to do this? Like every couple of days or something, depending on. But I've how are recently, we utilizing his expertise? In well, this? hang on a minute, All let right. me, dude. 
Let me ask a question. Let okay, me get yeah. into detail about it. <laughs> okay. This is my you life. Have been, you have gotten into great detail about it. I'm not done. <laughs> okay. So anyway. It's I'm like a, a strip tease. I'm ahead. Yes, yes, it is. Yes, it is. Let me undress me. the well, story. They call in England the wind up. You in know, a seductive so. manner. <laughs> oh, wow. So anyway, I'm a bald guy. And then all of a sudden, my wife tells me that I think I didn't shave. She was like, I actually like it if you got a hairy chest. And I was like, why didn't you tell me that? And she's like, I don't know, you look like you like shaving yourself. I was like, yeah, but I would do that. So then I did it, and then she likes it, so then I grew it out. And I was like, man, it looks weird with my legs. So I let my leg hair grow out, and I can't commit to my arms. It doesn't feel right. But then it got me thinking, and that's what this, here comes the question. <laughs> <laughs> my hair wants to grow long. It's like a, it's blonde hair, but it wants to grow long is that because my body is growing hair to stop me from getting cancer from the sun? Like, is there a body reaction mm -hmm. where, because I'm fair, I'm fair skinned, mm -hmm. is my body growing hair on like my arms and stuff, and, and, and to to stop the sun from uh, killing me? Yeah, I mean, hair is protective. So, a couple things. One is. Um, wasn't a stupid question. Hair, hair is, <laughs> I think the, the hair is growing to prevent you from getting right, more so tattoos. It could be trying to protect me, no? Hair, I mean, hair is protective. If you've ever, uh, well, you guys have both gone snowboarding or up to the mountains. Yeah. And, um, when you have some hair on your face, it's less cold and less painful, right? Yeah. So it is protective. Um, it acts as another layer, right? Yeah. Sure. Um, the interesting thing about hair, at least the most interesting thing to me about hair, is that Every one of your little hair follicles, which are all over your body, has stem cells in them. So nah. That, yeah, they continually renew that hair. So I'll give you a couple facts about hair that most people don't realize. You know the reason hair goes goes gray, which I'm starting to get a lot nah. more, is that as you age, that follicle starts making peroxide. So when like guys like Tony and them were bleaching their hair, you, no, you hadn't had naturally blonde hair, but like in the '80s, I remember everyone was like yeah, bleaching yeah. their hair. No, was, with peroxide, your yeah, body I was naturally, exaggerating it. <laughs> naturally, sure. naturally makes uh, <laughs> the number of kids that had that haircut. <laughs> I know. Oh I know. my God. No, People watching this are not going to uh, just, you have to understand the number of kids that showed up, skateboarders and non skateboarders, with that haircut. Yeah. Was unbelievable. I, I, someone was, told me that that um, there were it's barber shops or uh, hairstyling places in their town that, that would say salons that said Tony Hawk haircut and then a price. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. Which is bizarre. Amazing. It's freaking awesome. I just borrowed it from Staub. It is awesome. So, so anyway, I wait. borrowed it from Staub. Got it. Got it. Um, Oh, hair yeah. changes color. So, it, so it, you, the the hair follicle has a little stem cell niche. There's some stem cells in there. Yeah. There's actually a guy up at UC uh, San Francisco named uh, Yamanaka is his last name. He won the Nobel Prize, showing you could take a hair cell, you put it in a dish. This this is happens now. You can give it four what they call Yamanaka factors. These are just like genes that you make during development, and you can turn that cell into anything: a neuron, a liver cell. This is going. To, this has completely eliminated the need for embryonic stem cells. You know that whole debate yeah. because those were taken from human embryos. Yeah. They don't do that anymore. They can take any cell. They can grow it in a dish, and they can grow a a, a Jason Ellis liver. Yeah. For you to give you back a liver. They can. I this is now I, possible. I, I, it's, I might have needed that if I hadn't quit drinking. I think I'm okay. Yeah. So it's good. So I don't want so, the Jason Ellis liver. By yeah, the way. No. <laughs> Fair. The, um, so, you know, hair is an amazing little biological niche that we could talk about for hours, the peroxide thing, the stem cell thing. But what you're asking is, you know, is is it the body's attempt to protect you from something? Yeah. Basically, it's a carryover from evolution where we evolved from species that had a lot more hair on them. And right. that hair has regressed for whatever reason. But probably because, you know, and... That means I'm a bit of a Neanderthal. A little bit. Uh, if you did 23 yeah. and me... Surprise! I did, no, we, I did do it. Let me guess. I was... We did it on the Let show. Let me guess, you're and above 2%. It was, 2 it, it was like out of like seven people and I had what... I was the biggest Neanderthal out of the everybody. <laughs> well, the, well, I'm guessing you both have some Neanderthal genes. Yeah. I mean, everyone does, but significant Neanderthal genes, which is not a bad thing. It's protective. No, they're good you're things. You're super... Human healing abilities. I know you're kind of got a recent kind of. Let's not call it. I'm a, I'm uh, I'm on the right track finally. Yeah. But, yep. but it's incredible. And also thanks to you and Dr. Gillette. Oh yeah, Kyle Gillette is a, um, it's a medical doctor who's uh, provides some advice. Yeah, the um, your healing abilities are insane. But so the osteoblasts are the bone cells that are those are the stem cells that give rise to new new bone. Um, it's how old are you now? I'm 54. Amazing. Like amazing. I mean, your the fact that you were even standing and riding <laughs> yeah. so quickly is just absolutely staggering. You're, Especially I mean, when his leg wasn't attached. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, well, and I know you do a ton to support it, which is which is great. I mean, you take care of yourself, but I think that um, people do vary in terms of their healing abilities, and yeah. that's a it is correlated with longevity. I mean, if mm -hmm. you, you know, it's like the Wolverine character in the X Men, right? I mean, he lived what like 150 years and yeah. he could heal fast. But you're probably the closest thing that I've heard of or oh, seen well, that somebody can heal like that is incredible. Uh, it's funny the the doctor that did my second surgery that got it straight. Um, he said my bone was so dense that he broke a drill bit off in it, and you can see it in my X-rays now. Wow. Well, There's you're a drill you're bit tall in my bone. too, so you probably make a lot of growth hormone, which is mm. good. I mean, these are just the realities of biology, mm -hmm. right? You, you know, you make a lot of growth hormone in your pituitary, so that's part of the healing process is growth hormone. It's released in the first couple hours of sleep. I don't know if you're, are you a good sleeper. Uh, for good. the first couple hours, yeah. I am. Yeah. Well, that's when growth hormone is released. Yeah, and, I, um, anyway, your healing capacity is, is remarkable. But yeah, I think that going back to this hair thing, I mean, I think there are a bunch of vestigial like kind of carryovers from earlier forms of humans. So like the appendix, we don't use it, probably had some function. You know, you don't need your appendix. Um, huh. um, male breast tissue. Why would you males make breast tissue? They don't, they don't lactate unless their, you know, estrogen gets very high, prolactin gets very, very high. They don't you know, supply milk for young. Wait, so, does that mean we might have, wait, no. we did have them? Well, all humans had multiple nipples during development. And nah. they, re they regress. Oh yeah, every once in a while you'll see somebody like that has pigs. extra. Like Yeah, I'll, every once in a while there are people pig who tits. have extra nipples. Every We had pig tits. The, we were webbed fingers during <laughs> Speak development. Speak for yourself. We had webbed fingers. And they regressed during development. They, they I've seen webbed fingers. Style. Yeah, every once in a while, extra supernumerary toes, things like that. They'd but, be better um, swimmers, right? So, so hairs are. Remember Aquaman, <laughs> he had webbed. Food. I had a friend who had legit web toes. Like, like his toes he, were this long and there were yeah. just webs. Was he a good swimmer? I mean, he, I th we joked about it all the time, but I can't. So you never put it to the test? <laughs> no. Fool. I'd be in the water all day with those bad boys. <laughs> yeah, there, there's, some interesting, uh, there's some interesting carryovers that we have. And then there are things that have regressed in us. Like we're very visual animals compared to the other animals of, of the world. A lot of animals are, you know, very nasal driven. Okay. But, you know, there are... There is evidence that humans have like pheromones, like, you know, that they can, you might have selected your mate in part yep. according to these subconscious, um, you know, odors that you can't really detect. Um, women tend to have be more strongly odor and pheromone driven in terms of mate selection than yep. men. Um, but we've given up a lot of these older functions, you know, evolutionarily ancient functions for things like vision. Um, you know, we have, we're one of the few animals on earth that have, Trichromacy. Your dog doesn't see like you see. It sees reds and greens as orange and brown. It's not black and white like people say. No, it? there are a few people who are colorblind for something called achromatopsia, where they they literally see in black and white. Yeah. Uh, one in eighty males is red green colorblind, so they see the world like yeah. a dog. So there there are a bunch of things about us that are optimized for life now, and we've given up a bunch of things. But hair is just to kind of carry over. What um, about going bold? Why is that? Uh, high levels of a hormone. We're, we're, I love the rapid fire because this allows me to just, this is what I enjoy doing. We're good, get um, ready. You, uh, <laughs> men and women both make testosterone and estrogen. Yeah. Believe it or not, women have more testosterone than they do estrogen, but still lower levels of testosterone than men. Is that do. why I have to do estrogen pill when I do testosterone? We can talk about that. But men Sorry. make testosterone. Um, in your case, you've told me that you take some exogenous testosterone. You take yeah. a little bit of extra. Um, in men, some portion of testosterone is converted to something called DHT, dihydrotestosterone. And that's responsible for male pattern baldness on the head, beard growth on the face, so it has opposite effects there. It's responsible for uh, penis growth during development. And it's actually, there's a there's something- Is that, that what happened? <laughs> well, actually there's a condition hey, down- Hey, Yeah, there's a condition called- um, Dick jokes with which Jason. Way, which way did it happen? Well- <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Man, sick burn. There's a, actually there's is a, better these days. There's a genetic uh, there's a genetic condition where people don't have the receptor for DHT. Yeah. Um, and there's a this is well known. I think it's in the Dominican Republic because um, it's genetically inherited that some uh, children are born they look um, biologically female, so it looks as if they have a clitoris and a vagina, and then at 12 they sprout a penis. It's called mm. the huevedosis. Yeah. yeah. You can look this up because DHT is secreted during development in the utero yeah. to create the penis and, and regress the, the female anatomy. Yeah. And then at, again, in puberty. And yeah. so, so you, you've lost your hair because you make high levels of DHT, my friend. How yeah. can they fix it? 
You want your, <laughs> you want your hair back? I was gonna say, and the next question is, yeah, you look, want your hair I know back? that, I know yeah. that, yeah, I know that they do. They can take ones out and then they put them in there and regrow it. But I can't because my head's covered in a tattoo. So they can transplant those hair stem cells. Thanks for setting me up earlier for that answer. Right. Yeah, they can. They can transplant the follicle with the stem cell niche. I gotta be honest with you, unless you're, you know, unless you're not shaving your head. I mean, chances are. How do I how do I be kind about this? Um, I say like a skateboarder, like your hair's not coming back. No, it's not. Yeah, I know, but there is back. a thing. If this yeah. podcast, like I can describe, if it gets big, then I know these people that do the glue on wig thing, and it looks real, dude. He did, he did have it for a while. It looks did real you? as shit. Everybody was like, "Dude, I thought you were bald." I was like, "What are you talking you about?" You got a good shape. I've always had hair. I'll just roll with it. Roll with it that's you're... when you know. That, that's that's when you know. Um, if Jason is is financially stable or not, if that's he, all, he has that's the all hair trying to say or not. Yeah. I, I mean, I, yeah. So you're, when you see me and, and yeah. you're like, Jason? Yeah. yeah. And I go, yes, Dr. Huberman? <laughs> <laughs> or you can do like the Tony Hawk hair of the 80s. You can. Uh, yeah. You know, oh, get the Tony Hawk see? haircut. I always wondered how do sheepdogs see and how did Tony Hawk see through I that? Think, I think haircut. it was just more like I would put it through. down for photos. Yeah, I would, I, have to admit, I would try to make it like get just over the eye for photos. It's pretty dope. I I uh, I confess I was jealous of the straight haired kids in the neighborhood because I had kind of oh, like curly yeah. wavy hair and so um, couldn't do it. Dude, you know? you, like you had to do the romantic. <laughs> I would have thing. crimping iron or something. Yeah, no, the, Dude, uh, no I, 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 I did not haircut. attempt. <laughs> and then <laughs> coming on the show, I'm be like, hey, hey, guys, I did Tony not. Hawk, Bird mate, could you imagine if Nutrafol was our sponsor when we first do it, started doing shows? I I can't imagine, but we would. Would we be better? I would be. I would have hair. Oh, instead of tattoos? I would have both, but if, do you know how cool I'd be if I had full locks and you just saw like a little bit of wolf right here? I, I don't know. Nutrafol's hair growth nutraceuticals go beyond genetics to multi-target. The root cause of thinning, including stress, hormones, nutrition, metabolism, aging, and lifestyle, all of those things that we are at risk for, Jason. Through yeah. whole body health. <laughs> Physician formulated using natural medical grade ingredients. Nutrafol drug free patented technology provides consistent, reliable results without compromising your sexual health. Men showed progressive improvement in hair growth and thickness after three and six months. Nutrafol is also trusted and recommended by more than 3,000 top doctors. You can grow thicker and healthier hair and support our show by going to Nutrafol.com slash men and entering the promo code HAWKWOLF to save $15 off your first month's subscription. This is their best offer anywhere, and it's only available to U.S. customers for a limited time. Limited time. Plus, free shipping on every order. Get $15 off at Nutrafol.com slash men. Spell N-U-T-R-A-F-O-L dot com slash men. Promo code HAWKWOLF. Now, back to the show. Do you want to know what— I, be two I, hawks. It was if amazing. If you want to get into the wheeze on that, I was growing it out— I was going big. I was going to go like full, you know, when um, uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers, oh, they, yeah. they went like all the way there. Yeah. I was on my way to that before them. And then I went, we went did Police Academy 4. Oh, yeah. And I was David Spade's stunt double. And the hair and stylist came up. She's like, mm, no. And just like all Didn't these bangs. Ask. I was the stunt double. It wasn't up to me. Like I was just the, I was the pawn in their you know, and millions of game. kids everywhere. Were and like, I, I was just yeah. like, I was like, uh, uh, but I could. Oh. I, just, I watched all hair fall down. I was oh, like, I'm not. I, I guess they I'm not paid doing that you anymore. Well. I hope they paid you What's well. That? No, I got fired. You got fired? Yeah, as because a stunt double. What'd you do? I got fired because I was too tall. Oh, Wait, they didn't I was know you say, were too tall before they cut no, your hair. I, I got hired, and then we didn't shoot for like another six Amazing. months. Oh, and yeah, in yeah, that yeah. time, I got went through a growth spurt. Amazing. By the time we got to Toronto, I was way taller than David Spade. And so HGH screwed they you sent over. me home and then they flew in Chris Miller. So yeah. oh, David yeah, Spade's okay. character in Police Can Be Four is goofy footed and regular footed in the in the clips. Fun fact. But anyway, that was my that was my hair story. Amazing. And does nine hundreds <laughs> and amazing indies. So they like you know, yeah. that's a joke only skateboarders <laughs> and, are gonna yeah, get. The anyway. sickest front side yeah. nose bones yeah. and nine hundreds. That Grant Britton photo of, of yeah, Chris Upland. over the yeah. over the hip is an amazing Do you ever skate Upland? Uh, no. Oh, you were kind of, it was like just after that, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah, and when I was in San Diego, I used to go down to Del Mar and kind of wonder where the park was. You oh, know? Yeah, yeah, it was dirt. I to, yeah, I used to. Um, so tell me what, tell me the story. You've, you've, uh, I, okay. I haven't I had heard it in great detail, oh, but yeah. you met my parents. Okay, okay. so in, it must have been, I must have been 13, 14. 
Uh, my dad moved out. I was living with my mom, and she was doing her best to kind of give me some so structure. Year, what year is that? So this would be like 1989, probably. Okay. Um, and there was a contest at uh, Linda Vista Boys Club. I don't remember if it was Castle or NSA or something. And I went down there, and um, there was a street contest the day before on some tennis courts. Mike Carroll, I remember, because I knew Mikey from Embarcadero. Um, anyway, I can start listing the names, but that's the era. I know there's some video footage someplace. Was that the um, one where the guy tried to jump in off the fence and then hung up on the quarter pipe? Yeah, I think that, was, that guy's name was Snaggle. And it was in and the- he got, he got chaos. Yeah, and it, do you remember? You do, you know who's, do you remember this? Uh -huh. you seen that clip? His name was Snaggle, and so this was, was in the chain. It was chain. nasty. Was, oh, he fell all, uh, yeah, I think it might have been seen that, it. I've seen it, I've seen the video, yeah. Yeah, this was in the chain wallet era. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. And he had literally a chain. Like a like, yeah, like, like a, a real one. Like a chain. It was he was yeah. just kind of uh, yeah. Anyway, that guy. I respect that. Um, but then there was a vert competition the next day. Competition contest. Um, and I remember uh, who was there. Uh, six out of my mind. Uh, uh, Cookie hit Jenkins. Mm -hmm. But the, the the finger flip. Yeah, the, the finger flip calls that yeah. thing. But he's thing was pretty wild. Flips it the way back. Yeah. So Side contest Side was there. Yep. Was skating the little, There was a mini ramp there. I was skating the mini ramp, hanging out, and everyone cleared out. And the only two people left there were me and Billy Waldman. And your dad, who was involved in the contest yeah. structure, right, um, came up and was like, hey, where are you guys going? And he and he was really on Billy's case because, like, Billy was, like, fully tilted. He was, you know, I don't know where Billy is these days. Does anyone know? Was he, was he the one that wrote for World Industries? Yeah, it was the Demon Child shirt. Yeah. It was mm -hmm. him. And um, yeah. anyway, uh, I'd become friendly with him. Um, and... Uh, your dad started asking you, like, where are you guys going? What are you going to do? And I said, I think I'm thinking about taking the bus up to Lancaster. But how did he, you know, I, how did he know that you didn't have a place to go? Well, because he started catching on. I had no idea where oh, I was going to go. Just, and he's like, well, flooding. how old are you? And I told him, and he's like, listen, you can't do this. So you should come to our, you should stay with me and Nancy. And I was like, mm, okay. And, and he's like, and do you have your mom's number? We can call and her. And Billy's not invited. You know? Actually, Billy was invited. Oh, he was? Billy was invited. <laughs> but then Billy. Oh, that's wild. I don't know if I should say that. Let's just say, like, Billy was engaged in some behaviors that then I think Frank was like, this is not a good idea to bring him along. Right, right. So I can't remember when he dropped that's, out. That's on, yeah. that's on brand for my yeah, dad, for sure. It, yeah, so um, he, I went with your father and your mother to dinner. I'll never forget, <laughs> they took me to dinner. And uh, Did you go to Sizzler? I don't remember, but it was it was like a really nice family restaurant. We ate, you and went to and then I'll Sizzler. Then I'll <laughs> and then I'll never forget this. After dinner, they ordered black coffee. Yep. And I'd never seen anyone drink black coffee after dinner. And I was like, wow, that's really punk. My whole life, like, like, that's what I, it, it was always like, okay, who's ready for coffee? So you'd have it too. No, but I, I just learned that. And then when I became an adult and realized that I needed caffeine through the day, yeah. or it should have it, I'd do the same thing. Still, like last night, we had a super late dinner, black coffee. Wow. So maybe that has something to do with the superhuman healing abilities. But yeah, when, so we then went to your house, the house you grew up in or one of those, and they're like, oh, this is Tony's room. And people, I'm telling you, because I, I mean, I don't know if anything can uh, embarrass you about your success. Like it's, it's phenomenal and it's, it's earned, by the way, it's incredible. And I walk in and there wasn't trophies. It was all trophies. There was like literally no place to sit down. Oh. There was a bed, but it was literally trophies. You open the closet, trophies. You open a drawer, trophies. It but was you know just, what's funny? The is entire room <laughs> was trophies. <laughs> no. And I remember just being like, no way. Like, I, knew, I mean, I knew because I knew who you were. I didn't live there, though. That's what's You didn't live funny. there. You'd moved out. So. Yeah, so that would like, they just, they kept them all. Oh, yeah, I was gone. amazing. Yeah. They made a trophy yeah. room. That's why he'd bring people over, just to impress them. Like, I, I don't know. <laughs> it was cool. I mean, and listen, for That's me as awesome, a young skateboarder, even though I was in the street thing and not the vert thing, I mean, it was awesome. And so I stayed over. I slept in your bed, Tony. <laughs> I slept in Tony Hawk's bed. I, bet I was 14. I know, I know the bedspread, actually. That's yeah. just funny. <laughs> and then the next day, they were like, hey, would you like to go up to uh, Tony's ramp? So they took me up to your spine ramp. And was that Fallbrook? The mini ramp, yeah. yeah. And you were there. And Ray Underhill was there. And oh. you guys were sifting through the most incredible pile of CDs that I had ever seen in my entire life. You really? guys were just like, and you were like, hey, what's up? And you were like, hey, if you want to skate the ramp, you went out, you unlocked it. And then I just kind of like pumped around on it and was just like, this was like being trans, I mean, like yeah. what what skateboard kid in the <laughs> late know, 80s? Right? But we, was, we, we didn't skate? Crazy. I don't think you guys were skating that day. Oh, I mean, if you had skated, I would have remembered, right? right? But I remember thinking, well, this thing is really big. Yeah, It has a spine. Which yeah, the ramp you know, was sick. A lot of that ramp vert ramps didn't have spine ramps back then. Some did, but not None, too many. Was the None. vert ramp there then? Yeah, it was. It yeah, was. I pumped around on it. Uh, you went up the hill to the vert ramp. Mm, 
I believe the so. mini ramp was attached to the house. Maybe I thought the mini ramp was a vert ramp. <laughs> <laughs> the mini ramp was, was, really the mini ramp was seven feet high, and then and then if you oh, no. walked up the hills, no. the vert ramp yeah. was was yeah. twelve. Yeah, I didn't drop in. I would have pumped around on it and was like with oh, the bowl yeah. attached to it. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay, yeah, pumped around in the bowl because yeah. um, Visalia Skate Camp had a bowl. Yeah. yeah. So the next year when I went to skate camp, which of course it makes it sound like my parents sent me a skate camp, a bunch of kids from Embarcadero realized we're like, this is skate camp. It's run by skateboard. We just went to skate camp. Yeah. Hung out until they realized that we weren't campers at skate camp. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and then just left. Don't do this, kids. Take? This was like early 90s, right? You know, so you just get away with it. Um, we stayed for like a week or two. Awesome. Yeah, it was fun. That the, place uh, was really cool. The place was amazing. Visalia? Yeah. The place yeah, was so much fun. Times. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I. So, how long did you stay at their house? Stayed two nights. So, it was the, the night before and then the next night. Oh, and I remember so just cool. going back and they could tell, like, I was so stoked. I was like floating. I was, like, yeah. you know, 13, 14 years old. Went back to high school. <laughs> <laughs> I was supposed to be in school, but I left for the contest. I was doing a lot of that and by myself or with friends and just like catching rides. Um, as I mentioned, I was just kind of feral and doing my thing. I went back and I was like, you guys are going to believe this. Like I went to Tony Hawk's house, slept in his bed. <laughs> they didn't did, they believe, did they believe you? Well, at first they didn't, but then. that sounds like but, a bullshit story. No, but story. I got photos. No, but I got photos. And, my, and Frank called my mom and he was like, listen. You know, you can't just like let him float around. And she was like, I'm having a hard time controlling him. And, you know, that was just oh, the man. beginning of it. But um, it was incredible. It was really incredible. Oh, my dad called your mom. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, because he, he was like, listen, you know, like everyone left. Everyone had some place to go. You know, he's so 14. Wild. I know, right? Yeah. And she was like, thank you. And she was like, he's such a nice man. Uh -huh. You know, this kind of thing. Your parents were super nice to me. They, yeah. I, no, I remember they were to this all, day. Because my, my dad had a, a very rough upbringing and was floating a lot. Mm -hmm. And so he recognized that. Yeah. And, and he did that for, I mean, a lot of my friends growing up, he could just tell that they didn't really have anywhere to go. So a couple of them lived with us for a while. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but I, yeah, he was, he was very good like that. Great. That's, that's really cool. I never forgot it. And, um, and I didn't he, know that story went so deep. I thought you just somehow ended up staying no, at their no, house no. at one point. It was amazing. And I remember thinking like, wow, they're incredibly nice. And I mean, you know, to all of us growing up, you were like a god. And so for me, I'm like, in your bedroom and meeting you in <laughs> yeah, person. And I wish, I wish you And you were cool. Like, you were just, you were cool. You were like, hey, yeah, if you want to pump around on the ramp, cool. And like, actually, I think I was grateful that you guys weren't there because like, what was I going to do? All I could do was watch, right? But, oh, um, so I would have been stoked to watch you guys skate. But if I was going to be there, I'm like pumping around. I'm like, I'm at Tony Hawk's house in Fallbrook. This is crazy. Yeah. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, it, and when, a few years ago when your mom passed away, I think I direct messaged you on Instagram. And I was yeah. like, I'm sure you get thousands and thousands of messages, but guess what? I know your parents. They took me in mm. when, uh, mm -hmm. and I need it, and it really helped, and uh, this is true, and I know it's, uh, you'll believe me if I tell you that they drink black coffee after dinner, and That's you were true. like, and you were like no that. way. This was like a factoid that like yeah. you, you had to yeah. have eaten a yeah. meal with them yeah, in order yeah, yeah. to know. So anyway, I've, I, I real ha uh, even as I tell the story now, I, I, uh, I'm feeling some of the same goodness that comes from people. Those things Yeah, that's super you, cool. So. I wish you would have uh, taken some of those trophies, because I lost all of them, so. <laughs> They're not there anymore? No, I I mean, at one point, I just didn't like living with the accolades or, or you know what I mean? I just felt like I want to keep doing better. I want to keep getting better. I, I don't want to live in the past. And and I, I remember seeing photos of other skaters, BMX riders, what anyone, athletes, and they're always like, here are all my trophies. And I was like, man, I don't want to live like that. But it worked. I well, mean, we just had Rick Rubin on the podcast. And um, people ask him, like, do you have your platinum records, your Grammys and all this stuff? And he's like, no. And they're yeah. like, why? And he's like, because that's about the past. Yeah. I want to create new things. That's in fact, how I feel. He has no art on the walls of Shangri-La, his studio. And he has no art on his walls. So, like, he and I, you know, I'm not name dropping. We're, we, we're quite good friends. And it's like, you know, and I'm like, what is this all about? And he's like, it's about the clean slate to create new things. Mm. Right. And so uh, I think you lucked out in a way. In a um, way, but but I did actually, there were some that that they kept that were that I kept, and with my board collection, and I ended up. Um, I've told the story before, but, but the trophies are part of the story. I gave them to Quicksilver to display at some of their stores, and then when Quicksilver went through some financial problems and and they got rid of their skate team, they got rid of me. They they had licensed out, sold bad hot decision. Clothing, Quicksilver sold out hot clothing. <laughs> uh, I didn't. I didn't remember that I had given them all that stuff. They threw it away. <sighs> they threw it away. Second. Bad decision, Quicksilver. I can say these things because, you know. So um, that was that was a bummer. But uh, uh, but one but yeah. one of my my original board that I had with the with the hawk and the mm -hmm. lightning bolt, that was my collection board that got saved from the dumpster. Amazing. And has been sold several times now to collectors 
<laughs> do you, yeah, I mean, they go for a lot in auction. They do benefits for kids and causes. This one I mean, went for a lot. And I know who bought it, and he's actually kind of offered me to get it back. So I feel thankful for that. I think mm -hmm. he should give it anyway. back. What's that? He should give it back. He paid a lot for it. Oh, did he? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But anyway, we're coming to an agreement. It's cool. Anyway, that's my yeah. story. Jason. Yes, Tony Hall. We live in a world that's more digital than ever. Did you know that? I did. I've started to realize that. Yes. With nearly every want or need just a tap away. Click, yeah. click, click, click. Tap. Get me good at stuff. <laughs> they haven't figured that out yet. Tap. Where's my hair? Just saying, it's not that great. <laughs> so many favorite digital services seamlessly meet the physical world when they're delivered to your front door. But until now, that hasn't been true for crypto. Right. Crypto is tricky to actually get out of digital oh, wallets. Oh, yeah, that's the robot money. Digital currencies have been tied up online with no easy way to bring them to the real world. I've got robot I money. I speak from experience. I don't know how to get it. Guess what? MoneyGram. Nah. <laughs> yes. That's why we're excited to share that you can now cash in and out of select digital wallets. That's me. That's what I need. Participating MoneyGram locations without a bank, credit card, or debit card. Give me it. <laughs> I was going to say. Yeah. Pressing yeah. button now. <laughs> Flex your finances using the only digital wallets with real cash access activated by MoneyGram. Learn more at moneygram.com slash stellar wallets. I have a very good memory. I, you know, admittedly, I, I do. Um, but um, I remember all of that really clearly and and it meant a lot you know like as a kid then you know like uh, you know you hear these stories like parents you know caring for you or something you know i didn't play football i didn't have a football coach that did that although the football coach at our high school was a good guy taught me to weightlift which was important because i was breaking myself all the time and back then skateboarders of course did not do anything related to fitness take yeah. care of so themselves you were lifting weights in order to not get hurt skating yeah and, and tie boxing because when i was 16 i was you know i'm you know, I'm about 6'1". I was that height. I was really skinny. I was about 145, 150 pounds. I kept getting hurt. And I was like, I need my body to get stronger. So I started doing, you know, chin-ups and sit-ups. I mean, the truth is my high school girlfriend, her previous boyfriend had played football. So I was like, okay, I got to like put some meat on, you wow. know, <laughs> well, skateboarder. But, but I got into it and I was like, wow, you know, I can actually, it was a lot like school. If I put the work in, I get results, yeah. right? And it, um, with running, I can, you know, get stronger. And so I went through most of college, not all of it, but I went through most of college in life, not drinking much. I lucked out. I wasn't into drugs. I never liked them. I liked working out. I liked working. I mean, I have my vices, but they're more, you know, they're not of the substance kind. And um, so it worked out. And, and I, but going back to the story about your folks, I mean, I think that it is true that like when you help out somebody in a tough spot at, a certain age, doesn't matter if it's just for like one day, one night, one hour, like you're really helping them out. I mm -hmm. think it, it, you know, I, I can attest to that because there yeah. are a couple other examples, but that one definitely lives, you know, in the in the list of, there's a, a list of top, you know, experiences. That's and pretty for cool. a skateboarder, I was like, I'm in yeah. Tony Hawk's house. And, then, and they, they cared enough to notice yeah. like, hey, like you've got no one looking out for you. You have mm -hmm. no money. I would think I was going to take the bus to Lancaster. I knew this kid, Jeff Rickabosh, who was going to help me out get it. And then somehow I was going to get back to Northern California. But I was just like floating. I just floating. It rubs off because he does the same thing for people all the time. He's done it for me a thousand times. It's He's awesome. always helping people. It's awesome. Like, oh, I mean, well, I, I just think also when you have, a, when you come upon success either by chance or um, by hard work, the, the best thing you can do with it is to, is to help other people with it or to pass it on for sure. I mean, that's, I, you know, that's mostly what I try to do with the foundation, but, um, but I learned it from my mom, you know, and she would welcome the most haggard looking crew <laughs> well, I was, to our house. I, I was, I probably hadn't showered in a couple of days. No, I mean, but I'm talking about know. like, you know, dudes were coming in with Mohawks and stuff in a time when there were no punkers in. Yeah. Like real gutter punks. Yeah. Like yeah. in the wild. And, and she's just like, Oh, look, Oh, you, that's so great you know yeah because a lot of people that see color? that and they just get scared but they really yeah. like there's a person in there oh it's awesome i mean right. you know i think uh well it, it's clear it, it runs in the family oh thank yeah. you that's yeah. that's really cool so that I, have, went, I have a lot of like i didn't know yeah, that you went well, to i didn't know that you went to actually went to fallbrook too though that's pretty cool you met yeah. ray like ray is yeah. a legend yeah. yeah i heard he passed away right he did yeah, yeah i'm sorry um, to hear that over 10 years ago um too many skateboarders too many, too many. I was going to ask We don't want to go this way, but like the then Ken, re, I mean, I'm so sorry, by the way. I, I talked to Ken about four months ago, but we weren't nearly as close as like Blayback and Ken were like right. this. Yeah, we were, I saw, we saw, we saw Blayback at the, at the, 
service. Yeah. So in, in, incredibly huge loss. There's, I don't, I don't know how much time we want to spend on this, but you know, I don't think people, well, people should understand the magnitude of that loss. He was, it's, he it's, was so, similar yeah. to Tony in a, where he just, everybody that brushed up against him was better for it. He helped everybody. He was the other, the second. Yeah, I mean, that uh, his partner, Hoonigan, really put it the best where he said, he saw your potential and he would not let you, Yeah, he wouldn't let you go until you lived up to your potential. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, and also to a lot of the kids like uh, Danny and Damon and those guys that like, you know, he, I mean, forgive me, Danny, I'm not going to speak for you, but, you know, we texted a little bit around this. I mean, he was like a, he gave bit, he was Business a facilitator. He was like, I don't want to he, say he was like a father figure because yeah. I didn't know their relationship very well. He may, very well may have been, but he provided business structure. He taught everyone how to do business. I mean, yeah. Blaze, Mike Blayback, we call him now because he doesn't smoke weed <laughs> anymore. I still, I, call, I, him I, still call him Blaze. I got him sober. I just told him. I we just met. Told, I just texted him before you really? got here. It's Blaze yeah. still. I was going to yeah. ask you about that because um, you were saying that you, you don't take drugs. Was it? Did any of your uh, studying of neuroscience? Lead you to that decision? Yeah. So um, when I was a, when I got serious about school, I took a class in abnormal psychology. That's what they called it. Now it, it describes everybody. It was like schizophrenia, bipolar. You know, schizophrenia is one percent of people, right? Room of hundred people, you got one schizophrenic person. So abnormal. I don't know. I mean, autism one in eighty male births. So abnormal. You have to kind of ask the question. But um, depression. I was learning about bipolar disorder. I was learning about all these things, anxiety, a lot of addiction, a lot of things that I'd seen at Embarcadero, a lot of things I had seen in families, mine and others. Um, and all of a sudden I'm learning it's neurochemicals and there's a there's an understanding to it. And, and I think the field of psychology is super important too. I have great respect for psychologists and talk therapy has its place. Psychedelic therapies definitely are showing themselves to have their place, um, et cetera. But at the time, I was like, wow, like the brain's amazing. And, you know, I drank back then. I wasn't into smoking weed. I never really liked it. I liked being in control of my, my faculties, as they say. Um, but I was also training. So I want to get up early the next day and run and lift and study. I need, I mean, I was coming from behind, so I needed to catch up. And I felt like the one advantage I had was the fact that I could not drink or do drugs. And I just kind of blew past everybody in my classes because they were all hungover. Or, early or bird gets cramming. the worm. Yeah, early bird gets the worm. And, you know, or even at scientific meetings when I was in my 30s and 40s, I'd watch people show up the first night, everyone would get plastered. And then on day three of the meeting, everyone's just like, you know, falling asleep in their chairs. They look like garbage physically, you know, they age more quickly. And I'm there like, you know, like the kid in The Simpsons, like, oh, oh and like that, you know? <laughs> yeah. And I, I'm just, I'm not as smart as them. So I have to work harder. In order to work harder, I need to take better care of myself. So that was kind of the logic. I, you know, I, I definitely party now and again. I'll have a drink every now and again because I don't have an issue with alcohol. But, um, yeah, with, uh, by the time I was in my early 40s, I was like, you know, I just don't want to drink. I just wasn't interested in it. Um, and then when I met Blayback, uh, it was in 2019, he came up to me and was like, hey, listen, his, his words, he's like, I'm a pile. And I'm like, what? He's like, I'm 60 pounds overweight. And he's tall, so he kind of hides it. Yeah. I was like, well, here's what you do. You just, you know, don't eat until noon or one, drink coffee and water, you know, and um, just Get on a bike and but just pedal. It. Just That's pedal like your life depends on it. And um, and just quit smoking weed. And the, the thing is, he just, at that point, he just, he hasn't touched yeah. alcohol or weed. From that conversation. He looks, like, he looks yeah. like a different person. And he's lost 60 pounds. Then yeah. he started lifting weights. Yeah. He looks amazing. Like, yeah. he's super strong. He does. Also, maybe it's those Polish genes and the fact that he grew up in rural Ohio. But, like, Mike's hand grip strength is, like, yeah. superhuman. He's also just, he's really strong. And he's carrying all those camera bags. And he's he knows physical hard work. And so when I ask him, like, there's yeah. a lot of aggression in there. Like he comes, he hides like, it comes very across. Well. Yeah, like <laughs> he's, I've always known that about him. He's always had something in there where I'm like, you, if you popped, I am running, dude. Like, I've got you stories, are, but I don't know if I should tell him. Anyway, he has two kids, including a son who's in his 20s, who's a good skateboarder. Yeah, uh, Noah and. Uh, I've seen some uh, interactions between those two, and uh, <laughs> and it's like, let's just put it this way: Mike can hold his own, you know, like, but he's an incredibly fair, kind, uh -huh. and um, but yeah, I, I remember asking him the other day. I was like, wow, you did, you got completely sober after so many years. And look, I did an episode for the podcast. Of, but our, when, when, our, he our approached cannabis. You, yeah. when he approached you, he knew you were. Yeah. Doing all oh yes. Yeah. Obviously. He heard. I didn't have the podcast yet. We started that in 2021. So this was 2019. I was like, listen, uh, 
yeah, Jake Rosenberg was like, he knows a thing or two about health. And I was I like, see. and so I was like, yeah, you know, you could do the cold shower thing. You can do it. But if you want to lose weight, you got to eat less. If you want to eat less, you know, I'm not going to tell you what to eat, but you know, just restrict the number of hours that you're eating each day, kind of intermittent fasting thing and drop the alcohol and weed and you're going to be good. Yeah. And he just did it. But he started getting up every morning and he gets on the Airdyne bike, you know, the yeah. one with a lot of resistance. He'll go for 30 minutes all out. I, and I'm like, are you okay? And he's like, I feel like I want to puke. I'm like, well, you all right? And he's like, yeah, it's great. Yeah. You know, and then he um, started paying more attention to eating well. And, um, and then he found he could work more. So, you know, before Ken died, he and Ken, like he'd go out to Vegas. They were doing all the, the driving stuff and photo stuff. He'd shoot for Subaru or Ford or whatever it was. And for seven days straight, minimal sleep. And he's like, I can do so much more even under these crazy schedules. Oh, right. Then he'd come in yeah. for the podcast, yeah. work with us in New York, do six interviews in three days. We've done some live events and just just blitz and he could just do so much more. Like he was respected. I didn't care if he was a good skater. He was blaze. Like he was the most legit photographer I'd ever met in my life. I didn't even know his first name. I met him. I was like, Blayback Photo. Oh, I was like, right. Blayback yeah, yeah, Photo, yeah. Blayback yeah. Photo. Yeah. And you know, and now he's one of my closest friends. He's like family to me. You yeah. know, because we kind of grew up the same. You yeah. know, he left rural Ohio, Michigan. He drove out at like 13, era, right? 14. Yeah, he he slept in the clothing stacks at the Gap oh, and we skated in Barcadero. I mean, the best is when he comes on, you have to ask him. Um, he grew up, when he was seven years old, seven, his parents gave him a can of dip and an and a, and a automatic rifle. And he would just go into the woods and just like dip and like shoot rifle. Like he was in the middle of nowhere, right? Like, he, you know, he grew up like that. I don't know then, this guy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, and then, he, and then he moved out. Anyway, I'll let him tell his story at some point. But he's an amazing kind of guy. But the, He's the, the best. But same thing. Like he found a craft that works for him. And even now, like we'll be out doing some podcast thing or live event or something. And, you know, two in the morning, you know, everyone's so on. Well, he's trying to get his sleep right now. But he'll just constantly be noodling on photos. I'm like, can you send me the photo of that thing? And he'll just, he'll go through a thousand photos to pick the one and just get everything right. So, you know, the people that I think that do well in this business, like you guys and any business, they just pour everything they have into their craft. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes to, to a fault, but, you know, to me, it's beautiful, right? I mean, or Rick, right? I mean, Rick's got a balanced life, Ruben, but he, you know, he spends a hell of a lot of time on the creative process. Like when someone comes to work with him, it's like, that's it. Yeah. He'll just disappear oh, for man, weeks. Yeah. And it's like, you know, you don't, you don't accrue that, that kind of, uh, you know, that list of accomplishments and anything without just being a kind of maniacal. And so sometimes I think substance abuse goes with it or other behavior, what they call process addictions, behavioral addictions. So food, sex, like those kinds of addictions sometimes go with it because ultimately it all comes from the same source, which is this dopamine circuit of anticipation, excitement, and drive. That's dopamine. And drugs like cocaine and methamphetamine, those are the worst, as you know, because they deliver dopamine without any effort. I yeah. mean, you have to find it, buy it, et cetera. It's illegal, but you get these huge dopamine surges and nothing else really can compare for a while. Mm -hmm. And so that's why process addictions are brutal in a different way because they don't give quite as much of a dopamine hit. But the problem is sex and food and washing your hands, which is more of an OCD, not an addiction, but those are part of life. And so you can't eliminate them completely, right. right, in most cases. And so, you know, I think that when you find driven people, you almost always find that there's some parallel tone of challenge in regulating. Mm -hmm. And the people who really succeed are the ones who learn how to balance that over time, yeah. you know. Or go. the good thing about substance abuse is that you can go completely sober, right? right. But I want to be clear, I did an episode, because you're sitting here maybe, and because it came up around cannabis, I did an episode on cannabis. And yeah, there I'm are sorry. some health benefits to cannabis <laughs> for certain people. But it was the smoking part that's bad. The smoking said. vaping's yeah. not so great, but because of the, the carcinogens. But, yeah. But there are people who benefit from it. There are people, in particular, there are a lot of young males who smoke really, really high concentration THC. Yeah. And that can trigger psychosis right. later in life. So, and we're seeing more of that now. Wow. Um, yeah. But I'm not saying cannabis is bad for everybody. I'm not saying, you know, I will say cocaine, amphetamine, heroin, are opium are bad for everybody. Yeah. You know, there's just no way around that. So I, I don't want to come, at me? this I'm isn't a... like a high school class because I didn't even attend high school, right? Yeah. But the, um, I meant because you already you know, knew that. But I want to be clear. I, I was looking like for confirmation. Yeah, especially if skateboarders that, right, are listening because skateboarders are going to be <laughs> you like, wouldn't do any oh, of that stuff. You know. <laughs> yeah, so, and then people always say, well, weed's better than alcohol, but that's not really the best compare. You know what I mean? It's like cutting off your, your hand worse than cutting off your You your, just got to, I feel like people say that when they're trying to duck that they do anything bad. Yeah, like it's. I know. I know. It's. You know, it would be better if I didn't smoke weed at all. I know. I just. I just like me. 
on weed. But there's some people <laughs> creative. But and you seem and, it's, and, it's, and so does everybody else. I like which is probably weed. the bigger part because yeah. I and, feel like without it, I'm just too pushy and too snappy. I need to chill out. Well, I mean, <laughs> I, I don't want to name names, but there are, there are you know well known comedians who've said the same thing. That right. it helps them in their creative process and it yeah. helps them be more regulated. And these are high intensity people. So, look, I, I mean, I'm not here to tell anyone what to do or not to do. I just think that with alcohol, unless it's, you know, a couple drinks or fewer per week, like it, it can become a problem. And with weed, it just depends on how much and how well life is going, right? When you put you it know? with the addiction thing, like eating, but you've got to eat, it, it's like saying to an alcoholic, you can still drink, but you can only have like one drink. And that for an alcoholic would be a trigger every time yeah. you had it. Yeah. So to be, yeah. the, like to, you're married and you're a sex addict, and then you you can have sex, but you can only have you know like it it, it does make it a lot more confusing. At yeah, least I mean that so much so that a lot of um, a lot of physicians and people who work in the addiction field are still having a hard time to like really defining the behavioral side. You know what's addiction? I think it's when it becomes maladaptive and your life starts crashing. Right, and you still right? choose to do it. Yeah, and listen, some people are in relationships where their agreements are such that they can see other people. Some people are in right. monogamous relationships, and so if they go outside the relationship once, then their life turns into a, a, right. a ball of mess. And so there's context to it. Right. So yeah. I'm okay because I'm okay to do it. I don't get in trouble. <laughs> I just have to call and get approval, and then I'm good to go. <laughs> that means I'm not in. I'm fine, right? Because I'm not jeopardizing my life. Well, anyway. I don't know. That's between you and Katie. <laughs> oh, okay. that's, that's between you and Katie. Are you, you're the oracle now. I don't know. Yes, For all things, know. Jason. I'm just saying that, you know. I'm just making sure. Well, you know, some alcoholics marry other alcoholics so that they don't have to feel like they're an alcoholic. Yeah. So there's uh, the other side too, right? Yeah. Um, anyway, I mean, I think it's highly individual. And yeah. some people just, the first drink they have, like, you know, so many great skateboarders that I knew growing up fell off or died or in jail or whatever because they just couldn't handle it. It, oh, I, know, I tell that. I mean, I tell that story a lot. I mean, you seem. I wondered this about you for a long time. I mean, it seems like you're in your fifties. You're still skateboarding super well. You're super healthy. You don't look like you're in your fifties. You're healing up. You have a life. You have kids. You're married. Like so, the drug alcohol thing wasn't for you. Um, it was more that when I was growing up, <clears throat> and suddenly we're thrust into the spotlight, and we're late teens, early twenties, and it was like, whoa, this is crazy. And then everyone else just jumped on the party wagon. And I watched their skills fade. And I was like, that, no, not doing that. Like, I, you know what I mean? Like my skateboarding, my, my skating and my ability levels meant so much to me and learning new tricks were, were so, they were paramount to anything else. So um, I watched that happen in real time and I was like, oh no, I don't want to be like that. Um, it wasn't until I just was kind of a mess mentally that I was partying a little bit more than I used to. Um, and then realize like this is going nowhere. And I'm guessing that even that was like not at Jason Ellis levels. Of it was it was brief. Yeah, it, it yeah. was yeah. it was brief. And 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 to the point where it was like, oh, now that is affecting my skating. And so that's when I woke up for sure. Um, I mean, it was affecting all my relationships and <laughs> all that contributed to it. But um, but as of late, yeah. And also like I listen to experts like you. Like I'm in my fifties. Like I'm not going out all night. <laughs> well, and people that take good care, even if they haven't taken good care in the past, it's remarkable. I mean, when you see people, you know, they see these posts on social media, like this woman is in her 80s or 90s and on the balance beam or something like, that's no surprise. If you keep moving, um, and not just cardiovascular exercise, but skill-based moving, mm. so skateboarding is perfect, right? The ability to jump and land is one of the, and without injuring yourself or falling, is one of the most important longevity skills. It seems mm -hmm. so silly, right? But as you get older, you're not jumping as much, you're not rolling as much. You just, you think about what you do when you skateboard or if you do certain martial arts and it's incredible. I mean, yeah, so I think that movement is the main thing. I mean, there's been so much focus on crossword puzzles and, you know, it, it, keeping the mind active, it's true. And I certainly, as an academic, I'd like to see people learning and keeping their mind active, reading books and digesting information. Social connection and movement, however, are probably the two most protective factors for Alzheimer's and Parkinson's for that matter. Mm -hmm. And there are of course some people who have a genetic propensity for Parkinson's or Alzheimer's that are gonna go down that path anyway, but you're going to make the, the curve a lot less steep, you know, and, and you know, avoiding alcohol, these kinds of things, avoiding hard drugs, but um, movement on a daily basis. So if I slam sleep, a lot, that's 
good for me. Well, the, the brain injury thing is a concern. Not right? hitting my head if I just fall on the ramp, like, ah, you know what I mean? Like, as I always yeah, As long fall, as you don't break anything. It's actually helping me. Jumping and landing would, skateboarding and landing would be better than skateboarding and falling, right. but you got to fall, right? Just, and yep. knee bailing is, you know, I mean, think about how much coordination is involved in skateboarding compared to most any other sport. Probably gymnastics would be the only other sport that has as much yeah. dynamic movement. Oh, we're for sure the greatest athletes yeah. of our time. Well, the jujitsu folks will say jujitsu, but I'll say, yeah, but how often are they like literally jumping through the air? You know, okay, so jujitsu would qualify as an excellent sport because yeah. taking up skateboarding late in life is going to get a lot of people hurt. Yeah. Um, not That's that right. I, Riley, Riley, um, my oldest son, he's oh, yeah, he rips. into jujitsu heavily. Is he also real like, tall? He looks like he's, yeah, he's pretty uh, tall. He's six one, I think. So he's going to have long reach for the um, jujitsu. Yeah, he's, 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 and he's getting up at like 5 a.m. to do it every amazing. day. It's, it sounds addictive. I, I think it, it, he's, but he's doing it so that he can stay limber and be progressive in skating because he, he's 30 now. So, yeah. I love that skateboarders now like take their health into consideration. It's a, it's both amusing and, in, yeah. and, and it warms my heart because I, you know, I always say you want to get good night's sleep 80% of the nights of your life and the other 20% you want to make the lack of sleep due to something really great. Right. Yeah. Like that's the idea. Um, not stress, not in the hospital with somebody. I mean, it's going to happen, but, um, but it seems like concentrating. Well, we know that people that try and do that, through, you know, dimming the lights at night, getting morning sunlight, getting movement throughout the day, not drinking caffeine too late, et cetera, avoiding stress, all those things. They live longer, they maintain their brains and bodies longer. And a lot of it is that growth hormone release that happens in the first couple hours of sleep. Wow. Hmm. That is a, you know, a reparative function and it's enormous. And so all the other stuff like ice baths and, you know, uh, nootropics and all that, all that stuff has a role, but movement and sleep, social connection, sunlight, those are far and away the big levers in this game. Wow. And the people that do, and you need to do it every 24 hours. This is what I think people don't realize is that unless you're really beat up from a few days of really hard movement or lack of sleep, it's just like every 24 hours, you need to re-up sunlight, re-up movement, re-up water, re-up food, yeah. re-up social connection. And some people are more introverted, but yeah, that's basically it's a every 24 hour kind of investment. So and you look at the phone. longevity and it's insane. People live into their 80s and 90s like, there's an 80-year-old sprinter, and he sprints faster than most 40-year-olds. It's crazy. <laughs> and yeah. there's a thing where when you see it, then you will believe you believe it can be done. Yeah. Because I feel like there are older people doing stuff at such a high level now that, you know, like 30-year-old skateboarders, they could they shouldn't be in their prime. And now there's 38, 40-year-old guys that are amazing. And then there's 50-year-old guys that are still on the ramp with them. Yeah. Like there was no fifty year olds when I was well, growing I, up. On I actually the ramp. did a speaking gig recently. Ever? Um, I never I was saw asking a questions year. from the audience, and and someone was asking me about, well, you know, what are the training regimens and stuff. I go, well, there there are some now, but in my day, like that was the antithesis of what we were doing, and you would be laughed at. Oh yeah, it was like anti jock. Were, yeah, yeah. I mean, wasn't there be, a skateboard doctor in Trans World, like in Trans World magazine? Barry. Barry Z. Barry Zaritsky, yeah. Barry Zaritsky, remember? Barry Z. There's only doctors. one, baby. Still around. That, that, yeah. Is he still around? Oh, yeah. He was, Do you uh, have a mustache? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. I kind of remember that. Very intimidating. Always. Yeah. yeah. Actually, he's got he's got kind of a beard now. I saw him a couple months ago because he came to town to, to stay with Mike. Ahead of his time. Ahead really? of his time, yeah. yeah. Because now, I mean. Ice, I, too. I mean, he, he, yeah. was, he was the first person to advocate yeah, for yeah. ice. And everyone's just like, ice? Yeah. I hear from skateboarders all the time now. Like, you know, how long to be mind. in the ice bath? And, you know, what should I take? He and he's out of his what? He's out of his ice mind. <laughs> <laughs> like, there's ice and then there's Barry Zaritsky. How long does he want to be in the I, ice? I blew out my knee in the loop. I popped three bursa sacks and then got on a plane to do demos with Tony and, and announce. And I showed up and the plane blew my knee up. And he was like, I need the key to your room. And I was like, okay. And then he would come in every three hours to put, Massive amounts, not yeah. a not a knee. I mean, he used to. I, I remember he would. I remember Jeff Phillips rolled his ankle super bad at some event where it, it looked broken, but apparently it wasn't. And he made him stick his eye, his foot in in ice in a bath. And I never had seen that in my life. Yeah. And and Jeff was like screaming, like nobody's like keep it in there. Got keep it in there for twenty minutes. Twenty minutes and. He skated. Amazing. Yeah, because yeah, back then the the uh, level of uh, therapeutic knowledge among skateboarders was like duct tape. The question was, do you put it over or under the sock? You know, it was like <laughs> he, nobody nobody thought about. He like, taught me a thing rehab. at a demo where I would get on my back and put my heels on his shoulders, and he'd have two big ice bags in his hands. 
Oh, and then you, and just, you go up and down. Your, your, yeah, yeah, I strip yeah. your legs, yeah. and I could totally feel more power in my legs for like twenty minutes mm-hmm. to the point where I have got off out of a demo and gone, Barry, ice me, like because because <laughs> yeah. I knew that it would give me a, a guaranteed extra kick. Do you tr- do you have those compression pants? Have you ever tried those? The air compression when you travel. I'm gonna get you one. No, of these. I've had. I, have to get I some wear extra the socks. long ones for Tony. That when you travel, the I first wear the night socks, in, I have to. You just you. It's like a. You zip into these things and you just and it fills with air and it, it's a compression. Oh, I've thing. seen those. They oh my god, you a lot, feel dude. amazing. You feel amazing. I don't have any sponsor relationship is it water to this. In, thing. Is it ice in there or no, it's just, air? You oh. plug it in and it, you feel incredible. What? I don't know why. Yeah, it's crazy. That and then when I land in That's New York, I make a beeline right for the there. Russian body. Your legs don't feel incredible. You do. You your whole body. Well, the flight over and the yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You feel amazing. I mean, if you're going to go nice travel and skateboard, you can have mine because I don't use it anymore. And mine will fit you. It won't fit Tony. Yeah. <laughs> You'll like Tony will be like, why don't you use it anymore? <laughs> uh, because I haven't been traveling as much. Oh, I guess. Okay. Yeah, maybe that's oh so why. you only use it on the plane? No, I use it when I get to the hotel. If you use it on the plane, that, that would be so Alice. Like legs. everyone saw Alice has got the compression <laughs> suit on the plane. It looked like he's ready to parachute out. <laughs> that's what I understood. Yeah. That's what I thought he was No, when you land, that. when you get, okay. get to your hotel or something, okay, so it takes 10 minutes and it's a it's a reset. Because normally I'm looking for a sauna. Anytime I land in a city, I'm looking for the Russian banyas because yeah. their saunas go to like super hot. Fifty, yeah, and they have the cold plunges and they'll hit you with the eucalyptus yeah, branches. Yeah, I do that. There's one in New York on Wall Street, and I don't. Again, they're not a sponsor, but I love this place. I think it's called Spy Eighty Eight, and the saunas there are so hot. And you go back and forth between that and the cold after a flight into New York, and you feel amazing. It's just they've got one here called it's Voda Spa. Oh yeah, and they've got the extra hot one when you go in there, and, and you can get a guy that'll. Wacky with the leaves. At what the does same that time? do? Well, the leaves are to bring the blood to the surface, is like circulate uh, for circulation. I'm I'm a big believer in the sauna and the hyperbaric chamber and the cold. I mean, if you're taking, you know, those are the those aren't the first steps in taking care of yourself. The other, it's we the both other have things, the cold plunge, but I think I, it, I, yeah, I have a I, I did the hyperbaric chamber on my first go round of recovery, and and I I got gun shy just because my bone never connected. My fault because I skated too soon. But I spent so much time in that hyperbaric chamber that I, I'm like, I don't want to go back to that thing because no, this time it around didn't if you don't, work that last yeah. time. You're probably a good candidate for the peptides, though. We talked about. Do you, do you use peptides like yep. BPC one five seven? Yeah. Not a lot of clinical data. Not a lot. Of, excuse me. Research data on it. Quite a bit of uh, anecdotal data. Listen, you heal fail. You you heal faster. But yeah. you have to make sure you get clean sources. Like you don't want to go buying the gray market stuff from China. Oh no, I'm, because it's contaminated. We have the same thanks place. to yeah. yeah. Thanks to it, you, it, I it makes a big connected difference. with Dr. Kyle Gillette, mm-hmm. and uh, I've been giving myself shots. Yeah, and BPC is a, it's a gastric peptide, and there's it's been known for over a hundred years that if you have a tissue that needs repairing, you put it in the gut. You know, they used to take fingers that were severed off, and they'd put them in the gut, and they would regenerate them. They'd reconnect them. There's an what? there's all sorts of gastric juices that are. I'm putting mine for stem right cells. at the break site, right yeah, at the fracture yeah, site. Yeah, it should work locally. Huh. Yeah, that and um, and sleep, and then some of the things that promote growth hormone and sleep, like cerebral. goji berries have growth hormone, but they don't have enough growth hormone to do anything, do they? No, but they have a bunch of other stuff. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The acupuncture, you know, acupuncture is a real thing. You know, now I think it's actually covered by insurance so much so that there's a lab at Harvard Med by my friend Chufuma. Yeah. is his name, and he's studying the mechanisms for acupuncture. And they're they're going in all these sites. You know, you ever seen the acupuncture dolls with all yeah, the little yeah, sites? Yeah, yeah. They're going in there systematically figuring out what's happening when needles are inserted at these different sites. It's incredible. Like certain sites stimulate nerves that cause less inflammation in the pancreas. So this is like a, these are published in high-quality journals. Other yeah. stimulation sites cause, you know, less inflammation in the, in the liver, in the kidney. So all this stuff that, you know, everyone was thinking was just complete, it's you know, not. woo. It's not. And, you know, it's just that there wasn't any Western mechanistic science. Why does and, it feel like I'm, like, floating in another dimension? When, during, during acupuncture. It's hitting, it might be hitting the nerves of your vestibular system. You know? It seriously yeah. feels like, like so it's vestibular. not a dream, but it is a dream. It's yeah. so strange. So you go, you do acupuncture? Um, yeah, well, I have um, a guy does body work on mm-hmm. me. He works on my neck because my neck is just sore from whiplash for decades. And uh, every other time I go, he'll do acupuncture in various spots. And as soon as he does it, it's like, like yeah. there's some switch that turns off and I go into some other 
world. Amazing. Awesome. Amazing. Yeah, for the TBI thing, I just want to make sure I mention this because a lot of skateboarders hit their head. I know your audience spans many, many more people than skateboarders, but the data on creatine monohydrate is yeah. most, you know, people talk about creatine, oh, for muscle building. And yes, five grams of creatine monohydrate will bring the water into your muscles. You'll be instantly, or, you know, within a few days, you'll be stronger. They're, you know, um, you can use creatine phosphate as a, as a fuel for very high burst, high intensity activity. So hitting the punching bag as hard as you can, the first five or six punches driven by creatine phosphate, not by glycogen or fat or other fuels in the body, sprinting, that kind of thing. But most of the data on creatine is clinical data or our clinical data rather. And it turns out that for someone who's about 180 pounds or so, taking 10 grams of creatine per day has been shown to offset a lot of the cognitive effects of TBI. That turns out that when you get hit in the head, yeah, so creatine is used, creatine phosphate is used as a fuel in the forebrain, which is one of the main sites of, of injury. Yeah. And so cog, it, it's a known cognitive enhancer. Dude, so there are a lot of data. Creatine. How do you take it? Just creatine monohydrate powder. Um, you can put it in water. You can put it in any drink. You can take it with or without food. It doesn't really matter when you take it during the day. You don't want to take more than five grams at once because it can give you some gas. So if we start distress. taking that, then we can't use that excuse anymore. Like, I hit my head a lot <laughs> when we can't oh, no. stuff on the show. They don't no. know we're taking the creatine, though. You can still use it. Oh, we can't. Okay, cool. How often? You don't seem... I haven't heard you talk about concussion much. Have you? Uh, He's, uh, well, I don't like people. to talk about yeah, it that much, yeah, but yeah. I've had plenty, yes. But I mean, both of you seem cognitively sharp but yeah if you hit your head enough times it's the low level concussions there's a the problem it's like the the woodpeckering of the brain against the, the skull. you mean like boxing yeah man i jason's looking at me because for a while and i was telling katie like i was like get him to pick up some activity that isn't boxing well skateboarding keep doing it but drop the boxing and please drop the stunt stuff yeah like the jumping through flames and hitting your head and like you know i mean i think it's awesome but i just you're so loved, Jason, and we just like we won. <laughs> Comedy's good because that that hurts right? the soul. Good idea, that right? Hurts yeah. the soul when it, it goes does. Wrong. It does. <laughs> it, hurts the soul. it happened to be the it's other day deeper. in front of creatine like, really, fixing it. Yeah, I did it in Texas the other day in front of Shane Gillis and Tony Hinchcliffe, and I bombed. Oh, you did. Kill I probably Tony. only bombed three times in my whole career. And it that was, shot live, right? <laughs> no, no, it wasn't. Kill Tony. It was the secret show. But they saw me bomb, so they came up after. It was like, oh, it'll you know it happens to the best. And it's like you saw it. I didn't want them to see it, but I thought when I went back to the hotel, uh, miserable and depressed, I was like, I'm not going to hospital because <laughs> that was a bomb. That was as heavy in skateboarding. That would have been you are out, you're out. But yeah, it didn't hurt. So there, so there you go. So I'm making cho good choices. Yeah, 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 you did the choices, comedy yes. store here yes. in LA, didn't you? I did. Done it a couple of times. Just like big time. Yeah. Oh, I'm coming, baby. I'm coming. I'm going to be funny. You just wait. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I uh, I got to know Tom Segura recently. Yeah, I podcast. was just there. With Tony yeah. and I went. You guys yeah, went on, we, on two yeah, bears? We went, uh -huh. No, oh, we went on your mom's house. Oh, I can't I wait did both, but we both went on your mom's I house. I can't wait to see those or hear those. He, he made him do a legit spit take. What? Like a, do you know what a spit take is? Uh -huh. I don't. Oh, when you, you're drinking something and someone oh, laughs and oh, everything comes oh, out of their nose. Nice. For real, like he got Tom. Was was Bert there when you? <laughs> no, nah. he was not there. Yeah, yeah, he wasn't there when I went there either. Yeah, and, he's but, fun. but the reason they did the spit take because the joke was about Bert. I'm not going to give anything away. Oh, but he said something about that. Bert that made Tom lose it, and it okay. was, it was a moment. Yeah, I yeah. remember. It, it. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> <laughs> the comedy community is amazing, and and I think are the you know pioneers of podcasting. Right, I mean, Joe yeah, and others. Yeah. I mean, among yeah, the sure. greatest pioneers of podcasting. Yeah, yeah, now they're. Yeah. I look up to them. It's funny how you get like when I'm in skateboarding, I look up to them. I got into MMA and I was older, so most of the fighters were younger than me, and I always looked at them as older and wiser, no matter what their age, because of the level of skill that they had. And now the same with comedy. I'm probably older than everybody that I look up to, except for like two or three of them. Like, I'm older than Tom Segura, but whatever Tom Segura says, I'm like, oh, yes, Tom Segura. Did you say so? <laughs> yeah. Like, they're godlike to me. It's a it's a tough venue. Like, that. I mean, I think as a, I only consume comedy, right? Um, but it, it, you know, God, that's got to be tough. It's nerve-wracking. You know, yeah. Very nerve-wracking. And, and the, to try to keep one-upping yourself. <sighs> do you, and um, Whitney, do you have you Whitney done Cummings? shows with Whitney? Whitney Cummings, my... We don't have that much time. Whitney Cummings, 
I did one show with with Ryan Sickler after I'd completed a set in a, in uh, open mics. He got me up in front of like 600 people. And then because of that, Whitney Cummings is friends with Tony and Tony's wife. She goes, hey, Jay, DMs me. I'm like, is this really Whitney Cummings? Would you like to do a show with me? And I'm like, yeah. Are you sure you know who you're messaging? <laughs> and she was like, yeah, dickhead. And then so open for in San Diego. She probably did say, yeah, dickhead. 1,300 people. Wow. How'd it go? Good. I mean, but that's good. That was, once again, I've had I didn't five. Put, I didn't set that in motion, by the way. I, no, in no way did I be like, you got to get Jason to open up for you. She saw your comedy. We talked about you. That's weird. That's awesome. Yeah, she's you amazing. Did. But she's the, like, for that, for her to give me a shot and then to, like, she was trying to help me beforehand and afterwards. The whole time I was like, yes, no, like, I was not home. <laughs> like, I was just like, don't, please remember your set. Please don't everyone hate me. That's all I could think in my <laughs> head. Jason's showing some vulnerability. Hell it's interesting because yeah. I always just think of you as just like skateboarding, martial arts. Rah, rah. Yeah, yeah, right. I've called yeah. you trying to help me try make a 540. You know me. I'm... I didn't I didn't bring it through for you. Yeah, but I made the right choice. Yeah. That, yeah. that day is coming. That day is coming. Oh, I was yeah. going to ask about it, but I didn't want to. It's not pressure. over. It's just not. That I'm, wasn't I'm, the day. Me too. How old are you now? 51. Well, you got to make it before 54 because 540, you know. Just saying. I plan on this Damn, year. Damn, I mean, I got to make one before I'm 55. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. Tony, you've made enough of them that it, it, you will make I'm more. I'm not of going them. out like that. No, it's not going to be on my last one that See, I broke my it. leg and there's no more. No, no. See, this is the thing that people are also now starting to realize about you because you have the history of skateboarding and everything you've done, but now it's also that you're not done. Which I think is a is a yeah, such a I beacon mean, for the rest of us who are you know. Oh well, thank you. I mean, there are very few people. I mean, I think it's you. I mean, I also like I'm thinking about Joe, right? I mean, it's incredible. I don't think people realize this. Three to four podcasts per week, plus comedy, and he's you know what do they call it? Working out. He's in the clubs in middle of the week, and also doing the other working out, actual physical working out, plus the ice, plus the boxing, plus the family, plus the UFC thing. It's yeah. an insane workload. Yeah. And I think a lot of it comes from the self-care thing and keeping a level head. But like, and you're doing it with skateboarding and all this. It's amazing. It's awesome. And you got like Still five trying. new ways to injure yourself every week, Jason. Yeah. yeah. Now I'm pretty pumped. <laughs> <laughs> it's I'm, awesome. I'm actually done with fighting. Good. Yeah. I have this Ellis Mania event. I'm just saying this. I mean, I'm not a dad, really am, but I'm, like, I'm just saying like, you know, because we want you around a lot. I'm, long, long I'm time. seriously. One brain says, bleed and like, it's just not worth it at you this got, point. I, I agree, and I've had it. I'm not. I'm not arguing. I'm. Just, I'm agreeing. I'm saying that I agree with you, and I've talked to people that care about me. And I'm this Alice Mania thing that's happening. That's the last time that I'm associated. Oh, there's with, one more. Yeah, in April. Where's that? In Vegas. Who are you fighting? There's talks of Tyron Woodley or or Pat Barry. So hopefully, are they tough or are they feeder fish? They're really tough. <laughs> Sorry, why? I know. Katie, Katie, please help him. <laughs> Can she persuade you? I like you? how you're, you're telling him, that, like, you're, you're giving him the stage advice yeah. and, and about how he stop. He's like, yep, yep, totally. I know. Just, but, just, but one more. But I got to fight these really crazy monster dudes first. They might pull out and then I'll be, and then I'll just be the, the announcer. Okay. If I had it my way, I would do that. That's where I'm set on. I'm, I'm already out. You don't have to do this. You know that, right? Anyway, we don't, this is not a meeting. We don't have to do that. But Katie, please convince him. I feel like Katie can convince you of anything. Yeah, she could. Yeah. But yeah. she's not trying to stop me from doing that. Got it. She knows better. It was almost an intervention. I was going to bring on the paper. Jason, you know we love you. <laughs> and there, but there are 20 guys outside the room right now. We're going to come sit down yeah. in here afterwards. You're not going anywhere this evening. We're going to bring I'm about in. to do my own live show when I get back to the house. And if I go, guys, I was talking to Huberman and Tony, and they were like, you should just not fight. And then all of them will go, what are you talking about? I bought tickets to see it. So maybe. I don't all right. Know. Well, oh, anyway. Hey, thank you for making time oh. for uh, sharing your wisdom and um, and your story about my parents. That was really cool. And I'm grateful to, to hear them. the whole the whole spiel. That's um, And, you know, I, I think that you are, you're fascinating to listen to. I feel like I, every time I hear you say anything, we're learning and also just your history with skating shines through. Um, and it's really cool to know that someone like you who is doing all this work and, and um, breakthroughs grew up as a skater and, and I feel like they are connected. Oh, thank you. I'm, as I, 
people can probably detect I'm thrilled to be here. It's like get to meet people all uh, know well, uh, well-ish. We haven't hung out that much, but we have uh, people like Mike in common and, um, you know, people who have, you know, posters of my wall since I was a kid and oh, all that. Since, and just a huge admiration for what you're doing and what you're doing. Because I think that what's come through is we're, you know, rounding up that discussion about uh, Jason stopping fighting now and forever and not doing this upcoming fight <laughs> is that, you know, th I think one of the reasons why you guys are so full of life, it's the dopamine. I retire. You know? There it is. I retire. <laughs> you're, you're re like, I don't want to be any more mental, mentally disabled than I already am. Here's the smartest thing I'm going to say today. I retire. I'm sorry, but I'm not fighting at Alice Mania. There you go. Fantastic. All right, we're going to hold you to it. Yeah, I think that, you know, like the, the dopamine and drive and longevity thing, I mean, once somebody gets a hold on that throttle where they can, you know, put it toward healing up and getting skateboarding again, many more 540s or doing comedy or science or podcasting, whatever it is, or art or music, you know, when you have your hand on that throttle and it's, that's great. It's when it's controlling you that it's a mess, right? Yeah. But what's cool is that people Damn. in their, you know, 20s, 30s, <laughs> 40s, 50s are doing it. And what's interesting, like you were talking about Riley, it's your son's name. Mm -hmm. Like if people are starting that earlier, like, oh, I'm going to roll jujitsu so that I can skateboard longer in their 30s. Yeah. Just yeah. think yeah. about the yeah. long arc of this. So I, you know, I'm like getting, you know, uh, you know, Chills just thinking about like if people are starting that now, mm -hmm. just think about the long arc of, of all the things that people are going to be doing. But so you're doing exciting. that more than any of us, dude. You're talking to the masses and you're talking in, in, in ways that people like myself can understand. I don't listen to all of it, but I take little pieces here and there and I, and I keep them. And if I'm keeping little pieces, that means everyone else is and they're all getting healthier and they're passing it. You don't know about Huberman? You don't know about the sunlight thing? Like I've said that thing to people where they go, yeah, I know about the sunlight thing, dude. I'm like, how do you? Oh, uh, yeah. Everybody knows now. Mm -hmm. So you're helping the masses, dude. Live longer and be happier. Yeah. It's Thanks. a big deal. Thanks, and living by example. Which well, is thank you. Which is hugely important. Thanks. I do do all the practices. Well, it's a labor of love and a, and a compulsion, just like skateboarding. So that's why you're so good at it, dude. That's how it goes. Well, thanks so much, guys. All right. Bye. Thank you. Like and describe, and stay healthy. Take care of yourself. Don't fight. Don't fight. <laughs> <laughs>